yeah, this is going to be one of those and now for something completely different moments after Michael's gorgeous uh, presentation on the creative city and the last one on uh, the planning politics in downtown Toronto. So um, this isn't, is not about Liberty Village uh, and it's not about downtown Toronto, but it is, I think it does relate to the theme of the next generation urban environment uh, question. So this project, yeah, so it's, it's really, it's a, I'm a geographer. I'm an urban geographer, not an architect. <laughs> Uh, and do, uh, study planning. I don't do planning. I study how planning works and some of the outcomes of planning processes, usually over really long periods of time. Uh, so this, and I actually don't have a, a gorgeous PowerPoint. This report, uh, I'm hoping to, to come out, uh, release it. Actually, no, it will be released this week. It's all top secret. Don't tell anybody that you've seen any of these maps. This is actually really, I hope it will hit the media uh, with a little bit of a thud, enough to, to, to make a little bit of difference in this policy debate around transportation planning in Scarborough. So it's really a public policy intervention. And we're, uh, I literally was up at 5 a.m. this morning tweaking the conclusions uh, and sending it off to the communications people at the University of Toronto, so there's going to be a release. We're actually trying to put together the last version. Um, so that's what I was doing at 5 a.m. instead of really tweaking the PowerPoint on this. <laughs> uh, and so it's, it's, it's really responding to a period of chaotic decision making around transit in the city of Toronto. And if you, are, if you follow what's going on in Toronto at all, uh, that chaotic period of transit planning started uh, in November of 2010, the, the Rob Ford's first day in office, 7 a.m. in the morning before he had been sworn in as the mayor of Toronto, he visited the office of the chair or the, the manager of the TTC and told him that Transit City plan was dead. The war on the car was over and he was scrapping Transit City, which was a, a light rail plan for Scarborough that had been uh, a designed, engineered, environmental assessment, evaluated, approved, fully funded, and Ford canceled it. Um, and whatever you might think about that, it ushered in a period, <laughs> I think it was a bad move, along with some of the other things that Ford spent the next four years doing. But the, the problem was, the city then didn't have a plan for transit in Scarborough. And for the last four years, we have had the succession of um, other alternatives and half-baked ideas and it became incredibly politicized uh, you know with uh, this very toxic debate between uh, proponents of LRT and the subways 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 crowd cheered on by Rob Ford and this kind of very divisive ugly wedge politics of Ford saying to the people in the suburbs you know, it's those downtown elites don't want to have a, build a subway in this, in, the, in this suburbs and you deserve a subway. And that, unfortunately, I mean, he is, sorry, I just got to get a thing of water. Ford, for all his stuff, was actually a brilliant politician in many ways. That message still really resonates with a lot of people in the suburbs, that they were getting cheated out of a subway and that this, the LRT cars are going to get in their way. So what, um, and of course the other problem, and of course now we have a mayor who actually has a, another plan that he promised in his election, it's called Smart Track, which I'll show you where it goes in Scarborough, uh, which actually I think is actually a pretty decent idea in terms of at the scale of the region, electrifying the go lines, having more frequent service, having a fast express services, 
uh, in the regional electric uh, rail, regional express rail system, that's what Metrolinx is planning anyway. That's actually a good idea, and Tory's concept is, you know, you could do it fairly quickly. So we're not really arguing against that. But what we're saying is that the currently approved plan, which is the Scarborough subway extension from Kennedy up to Shepherd via the Scarborough Town Centre, actually has not been evaluated. I mean, it, the, it's been a media kind of circus over the last few months of people saying, oh, wait a second, if you build Smart Track, you've got this subway. They're like two kilometers apart. It's like building the Young and University lines in downtown Toronto through, you know, Bay and King, except it's in the middle of the suburbs in Scarborough. And none of the sort of detailed evaluations of where these lines are being built has been done. It's all been these colored lines on a white canvas, uh, in the, in, and nobody's actually really done this detailed examination of the urban form, the redevelopment potential, where people live, where people work. It actually really hasn't been done because there's been this sort of cycling of different plans and different ideas with different people pushing them. Uh, I was a bit involved in some of the debates around evaluating, you know, the, this, this, the subway ideas, and it's, it's a very toxic debate where if you get on a stage and talk about it, there's people screaming from the back, saying, you know, trying to shout the speakers down. It was, it was really ugly. Anyway, so, foolish me decided that I, we, I wanted to actually make a bit of a, an evidence-based uh, contribution to this nasty little debate that we're having in Toronto about what kind of transit to build in the suburbs. Um, and so that's what this is. It's saying th these different options need to be carefully analyzed and compared. And uh, our starting point is uh, the urban form in the suburbs of Toronto was actually incredibly carefully planned. It's, it's a tight, tight fabric that actually doesn't have a lot of development sites, and I'll show you that in a minute. So probably I've already gone over my whole uh, first uh, paper. So yeah, we know we need a lot of investment in public transit. Uh, we've had this chaotic planning process. So this is an evidence-based contribution to this debate. And uh, my expertise is really analyzing urban form and, and trying to quantify uh, well, what the what exists, and and then doing. I, I just have two papers coming out. Uh, that's another part of this research project on the urban form in the metropolitan Toronto area, and one of them's on Scarborough. Where uses Scarborough as a case study, going right back to you know the early, late 40s and how the the planning system was very carefully engineered to create the the urban form that we actually do have now. Uh, so we're basically saying any new high-capacity public transit system has to take care, a, a careful consideration of the existing urban form uh, and the redevelopment potential. Uh, and that any time that you have high-capacity rapid transit, you need to have a, a very uh, high-density uh, pedestrian networks because at both ends of every transit trip you've got a walking trip. So we're starting with let's look at the pedestrian networks on all of these um, uh, different routes. So there's Scarborough. Scarborough is actually huge. It's actually uh, you know it, it, it's uh, well it's just a, an enormous area uh, a, a big chunk of the, the black is the built up area of Toronto in 2011 and there's Scarborough and the green belt so here's Scarborough this is basically uh, just a land use map I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute but just so you can understand what you're looking at uh, yellow is oh shoot that's not what I wanted to do Oh, there we go. Um, I wanted to use this. No, where's the where's the, uh, the pointer? Po pointer? This one's the very top. Ah, right. Okay. Great. Okay. Yellow is uh, residential. Uh, purple is employment lands. Red is retail. Green, of course, is parks. Uh, uh, 
blue is institutional, that's University of Toronto Scarborough. So, you know, uh, full disclosure here, I have a, I have a bias uh, about wanting to have uh, slightly better public transit to University of Toronto Scarborough. We have like 14,000 students uh, who uh, have a, a really crappy bus service out to the campus right now. One of the transit lines, the LRT lines, uh, was supposed to have opened uh, about four months ago that was part of the, the system that uh, Rob Ford cancelled because at University of Toronto Scarborough, which is that big blue thing, right there is the new Pan Am Games aquatic facility uh, and part of the package that our students actually voted to tax themselves $25 a year uh, in fees was there was going to be the, the aquatic facility and a light rail line that serviced it. Anyway, so the, I, I, yeah, I, I confess my own bias. Uh, there's the, the 401 highway, that's Scarborough Town Center. Uh, this is the zoo. And in all of our measurements, we're excluding Rouge Park, which is a national park. It's, it doesn't, it's not really a local park. Generally, we're considering that local parks are part of the infrastructure for residential neighborhoods. Just one other thing is apartments and condominiums are this dark brown and townhouses are the orange. So you can see there's areas of townhouses and areas of apartments. So this is Eglinton, Lawrence, Ellesmere, Shepherd, Morningside, Brimley's over here. So um, what we're saying is um, the, the, the work there's different kinds of arterial roads in Scarborough. All of the east-west arterial roads are 120 foot wide. They're incredibly wide rights of way, public rights of way, but there was an evolution or a deliberate policy move by Metro Toronto that mandated this kind of arterial road. They did not want to have smaller streets connecting to the arterial roads to, to be able to allow free flow of traffic they restricted the number of entrances to a few. So this is Finch and there's Eglinton between the same places, uh, Midland and Brimley. So to, to show you where they are. So here's the, the one on Eglinton and uh, there's the one on Finch, okay? Uh, so same, I think I've got that right, have I? Or maybe? Yeah, I think that's right. It's, it's this bit and this bit. So this area, the, the frontages along the arterial roads developed uh, in, by, the, by the 50s when Metro comes in to starts doing its, its official plans. A lot of those frontages were already developed. They were not able to impose their new Metro uh, road standards on Eglinton and uh, Lawrence. They actually did quite a bit of planning, but it was... Also, they were dealing with these big lots that were fronting onto the arterial roads. By the time we get to, uh, by the time of the first Scarborough official plan, 1957, none of this was developed. This is a completely blank slate that they were able to really impose the new concept of arterial roads. And it really is this, where you've got this is all single-family detached houses that front onto the local distributor roads inside and they are, have the reversed lots that have the back of the houses. I'm sure you've all seen these in the suburbs. Uh, Mississauga has almost all successfully implemented this new concept of arterial roads, which I believe is basically a frozen forever traffic sewer. This is never going to develop into anything else than a corridor for cars, right? Whereas Eglinton and actually Shepherd and uh, Lawrence have these large parcels, almost all in retail use, uh, disposable buildings, single story, cheaply built with a lot of surface parking. This is prime redevelopment sites for mid-rise avenues uh, forms of building and, and will be uh, easily and probably felt it fairly quickly redeveloped if there is uh, a transit corridor, no matter what that, you know, a better quality of public transit on those corridors. Whereas this really, I mean, if, yeah, no, it, nobody's ever going to go in there and start buying up those houses. They, it, the, 
they have a huge amount of opposition, but it's also, these are all designated as stable residential areas, basically. So in our research, we're assuming that it's basically, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so that's the two kinds of arterials. This is um, stable residential neighborhoods. We're saying this, these areas in Scarborough of uh, single family houses, townhouses, apartment buildings, the, the schools, institutional parks, uh, essentially that's 80% of the land area, including the, the streets and the 401. So none of that stuff is really likely to be redeveloped in the foreseeable future. And this is what's left if you take that out. And of course, you know, we're, th there is going to be some of this is actually going to redevelop and intensify. But most of it is either stable residential neighborhoods or it's just too, very difficult to, to redevelop. What you've got, if you take away that, is this is what's left over. So you've got the big hydro corridor slicing at an angle. You've got your employment lands. Uh, you've got the retail, there's Scarborough Town Center, you've got the railway, that's not likely to redevelop. The hydro corridors are kind of off limits. What we've got, really, and of course the employment lands are also potentially a, a, a huge uh, redevelopment opportunity in the future, but the policy, and pro quite correctly, is those are now completely off limits. In the, in the 90s, uh, uh, the Harris government said, we will allow conversion of employment lands, uh, retail is a use that's allowed in employment lands. And that's when a lot of this stuff in those big sort of zoned employment areas t shifted to retail. And that's now no longer permitted. And the, the employment lands, they're, they're really trying to protect them from residential development because that would just simply drive up the, the, the value of those lands and nobody would be able to keep their factories there, they'd all get sold off. Uh, it wouldn't be affordable to use for employment uses. So we're saying in Scarborough, the, 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 the opportunity for development and intensification is these east-west corridors, not so much Ellesmere, but Shepherd, Lawrence, and Eglinton, Kingston Road to a certain degree. You've got a big area of undeveloped land. Those are the UTSC lands. Uh, 200 acres is actually the biggest parcel in, in Toronto uh, and it's scheduled to become a kind of high density mixed use node with, well, campus and stuff like that. Some other undeveloped land up here. Some of the old, the Scarborough Expressway that the city finally sold off a few years ago. So that's actually, you know, in terms of uh, available sites in the, the, the suburbs, there, there really isn't that much except those retail sites that are likely to be redeveloped. And of course, the shopping malls, like this sort of place, and up here on Finch, uh, developers have already bought those with the intention of, uh, a lot of them were, you know, not so successful malls, uh, but they they're really are moving ahead with intensification in those spots already. So what we did, a group of undergraduates that I had working as RAs this summer uh, coded the pedestrian networks through for the whole of Scarborough. Basically, and then, but uh, so we drew the lines because there isn't a database that says, you know, where these uh, pedestrian networks are because it's not all streets. There's also paths and there's stuff that goes to schools. Um, but also, uh, they were also coding for the quality of the environment. So whether, is there a sidewalk or not? You know, and we coded both sides of the street, but then we said, okay, if there's no sidewalk, then that's a different kind of pedestrian infrastructure. And we're doing an evaluation of the, uh, we've got uh, some focus groups of people saying, okay, when you see a spot like this, is this a good place to walk? And then we're gonna, that's the second, next stage of the research. But so, and then we're looking at all of the parcels fronting on all of the avenues, east, west, and north, south. And this is just a coding partly of building heights, but also looking at combining, you know, building heights and, uh, and different kinds of land use. Uh, at this stage, we hadn't yet done Ellesmere, but that's, so this is just a stage of the research. Um, but this is actually the sort of the, really the basis of this particular uh, uh, study now. So this is Shepherd. So there's our 
pedestrian networks. And of course, see, the thing is that on these big arterial roads, it's actually quite variable the amount of pedestrian network that's accessible from any particular transit stop. So we've got the transit stops. Um, this is an, an employment area, but you can see how thin the network is. But even um, in, in other places, right, where you've got some really large parcels, it, the standard for transit planning is always 800 meters, and of course that's an approximation. Some people won't be able to or won't be willing to walk that far. Other people will walk farther, but that's the normal. So this is 800, uh, pedestrian networks within 800 meters walking, shortest route, uh, jaywalking included, uh, of uh, any of these transit stops. And then we clipped or we attached all of the land parcels that c were accessible from that pedestrian network. Uh, and we then clipped the um, census uh, dissemination block data on population and then attached to that jobs numbers and then evaluated what the land uses are and all that kind of stuff. Um, for all of these different corridors, and so then these are the, I'll show you the different combinations, but basically what's on the books now is, uh, maybe I should actually, yeah, I'll just go, anyway, so this is all of the uh, pedestrian networks for all of these different um, uh, transit corridors that are now in the mix, in the debate in Toronto. Um, so. And we've, so we've got the data on each of those corridors separately, and I'll, I'll go through what the data that we're looking at, but I just wanted to look at the, the different combinations, and we're putting them together in combinations, and this is actually a, a stay, step that I was really reluctant to go into, because it's trying to say we're, we're, we're really not advocating a particular solution, we're trying to measure them all in a consistent way, and let the, the numbers speak for themselves, but anyway. Uh, the thing is, none of these uh, transit uh, 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 investments are ever talked about by themselves. They're always in combination. So we're putting together the, a list of the five likely combinations. Um, so this is basically what is approved by the City of Toronto at the moment. City Council uh, in 2013 approved this. That's the Scarborough Subway Extension. Uh, from Kennedy up to Lawrence and McCowan, Scarborough Town Centre and Shepherd. That's approved uh, without any engineering or really a detailed budget. I mean, you know, it's sort of, I mean, there's some budgeting, but it, 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 it's, it, it's pretty sketchy. And then about three weeks ago, I guess, uh, the star had this great sort of analysis saying, wait a second, it's too close, this is where the smart track will go, these are too close to each other. And the star was saying, okay, what if we went here, or what if we went here, and what if we went here, and zipped back to the Scarborough Town Center, which of course needs to have some kind of rapid transit, large capacity rapid transit. Um, so who knows if this is actually the route that will go, but this is an approved plan. And then there's the Shepherd line, which is also approved. It's got an environmental assessment. It's fully funded. Is it like 100% of the cost will be paid by the uh, government of Ontario? Unfortunately, uh, John Tory has said that he has no intention of changing that plan, but it's not a priority, right? So it's an approved plan, fully funded, but it might not happen until after Smart Track or maybe after the subway. So we don't know. But so we're putting, saying, these are the approved plans. That's our option one. Option two is the two approved plans plus Smart Track. So this is what Smart Track, or the Scarborough portion of Smart Track, it's on the go line, Scarborough Junction, Kennedy, the end of the current subway, uh, Lawrence, Ellesmere, Shepherd, Finch, and Millican stations. Uh, and of course, this is what John Tory is determined uh, he's going to build. So we thought, this is a likely candidate that we need to evaluate. Um, so option two is those three. 
option, oh, sorry, option two. Option three, this is the um, transit city light rail plan that Scar uh, jo uh, Rob Ford canceled in 2010. So there's the Shepherd Line. There's continue this is Eglinton Cross Town, which is under construction and will go to Kennedy. It was going to go along Eglinton, up Kingston Road, up Morningside, make a little jog at UTSC to go right into the center of the campus, and there's going to be this big transit hub where the GO buses go and Durham Transit feeds to there. It's their only stop, uh, uh, apart from Scarborough Town Center, I think. Um, so, smart track and Transit City, and then except the only modification we've made is if Transit City gets built, there's no need to rebuild the Scarborough, this is the route of the Scarborough RT extended to Malvern, which was always what it was supposed to do. We've just eliminated rebuilding this section. There isn't enough width in that corridor anyway, but also why would you do that? You've got, you've got the smart track line. Uh, so that's our option three. Option four is, um, right, what if it's impossible to build smart track? Uh, so you've got the subway and the transit city networks, uh, except, oh, I, I used an old map. Uh, if, if we're, uh, no, I, so in our, the data that I'm, I, sorry, I just picked the wrong one when I quickly threw this together, uh, no Malvern line, because then you've got the subway going to Scarborough's town center. Nobody is ever going to build this little bit of light rail, like there'd be no reason to do that. Uh, and then option five is uh, if um, Tory gets his smart track and the city council proceeds with the Scarborough subway extension and you know, the, the Shepherd LRT kind of fades into the distance and never gets built, this might be what would happen, right? You've got smart track and the Scarborough subway extension. So, um, I'm going through this really quickly here. Um, just, yeah, there's a lot of numbers there. But this is the, the individual corridors. Oh, one other thing I should mention. The Scarborough subway extension currently, I mean, the engineering hasn't been done. They haven't decided exactly you know, where the stations will be. But the one that uh, city council approved was going, costing about $3 billion. Uh, and the, th the uh, three uh, light rail lines, you know, uh, Shepherd and the Eglinton, Kingston Road, Morningside, and the Ellesmere through Scarborough Town Center to Malvern, total about 2.5 billion at, at the, the prices that they were estimated for the environmental assessments in 2010. Um, so it's cheaper to build the three LRT lines than the subway. So this is one of the points of the argument that we're making is if we assume that maybe smart track happens, then it's worth comparing, you know, does, and, and we're also saying if smart track is gonna, gonna go ahead, we really need to reconsider the Scarborough subway that has, because then you've got this way over build of high capacity public transit in that little corridor. So we've summed the three LRT lines and saying, well, they're comparable in price to the Scarborough subway. Now, um, so, for, we're, so just the metrics. First is uh, the length of the lines, just so that we can sort of uh, do on a per kilometer basis. Then we've got the area accessible within 800 meters in hectares. So that's the total area of parcels, excluding street area and public parks, uh, it's the private land parcels that attach to those pedestrian networks um, within 800 meters. Then the uh, per kilometer, just to be able to compare, then the total network, that's like adding up all the pedestrian routes that are accessible in that corridor within 800 meters. Uh, the redevelopment area, that's um, retail sites, parking lots, uh, not only parking lots that have their own parcel, not that are attached to a store. Uh, uh, retail, parking lots, and undeveloped, basically. We're saying is the, the main opportunity for redevelopment and intensification. Then we've got population, 
population per kilometer of line, number of jobs and jobs per kilometer of line. So the basic um, thing is, uh, Shepherd, the, the LRTs, of course, are much longer. And it's, it's really, I mean, it's kind of crazy to compare, right? How do you compare a, a subway or even smart track with an LRT system, right? The LRT is, I mean, you could have it just as frequent, but it's, it's on the surface. Uh, it's a different kind of mode. It goes a little bit slower. It doesn't have quite the same capacity, you know. You, uh, but we're saying, well, it's comparable because that complete LRT network would cost a bit less than the subway, basically. And, and actually, the, we, nobody knows what the smart track would cost. Tory was saying seven to eight billion. Uh, seven of the 22 stations are in this part of Scarborough, or, or in Scarborough. So a third of that, again, it's about the same price. I don't think it's actually going to cost seven, eight billion, but who knows? We just know, just know the study hasn't been done yet. But it's also, so the, that segment of the smart track is about the same price as the subway, is about the same price as the whole network of LRT lines, so it's comparable. Um, so, and it's probably best to simply compare not the individual lines, but the options. So that's here. So basically, option one is uh, the two existing ones, Shepherd and uh, the subway. Option two again, and I should have put this on the slide, uh, is plus smart track, right? So it's the subway, Shepherd, and smart track. Option three is smart track with the LRTs. Option four is the subway and the LRTs, and option five is that sort of, I think it's the worst case scenario, we get the subway and smart track. And uh, clearly, I mean, if you look at the total area that's walkable by foot uh, with option one, 1,200 uh, hectares, option two, uh, so that's got the Shepherd LRT in it. It's the Shepherd LRT in the subway, right? Uh, option two is adding smart track to that. You know, considering you know smart tracks another 600 hectares. Option three is the full LRT uh, system plus smart track, by far the highest, right? It's like triple, uh, or not quite triple, the total area within walking distance of your stops as option one. Uh, option four was, somebody remind me. I should have put this on the slide. So, uh, no, it's uh, the, the, the LRT network plus uh, the subway, not smart track. And then this is smart track and the subway. So the, the LRT network at smart track is like three times as much of an area within walking distance of stops. And that's, I mean, that's obvious. Right? I mean, what a, what a kind of stupid thing to be arguing because the LRT is much longer. But, I mean, if you're saying that these are equivalent amounts of investment and the, the, the prime area in terms of transit-oriented development is within walking distance of stops, it actually does, it is meaningful. But also, per kilometer of route, uh, the LRT systems actually perform better as well. Uh, so, they're also, it's because they're on those big arterial roads that have connections into the neighborhoods, whereas the smart track is running through the middle of an in, in industrial area. Right? Uh, and this, the subway is running in an area that has very little development potential at all, except for at Scarborough Town Center. Uh, so then, um, if we look at uh, network length, so the total pedestrian routes that attach, again, you have a much higher performance of smart track plus the LRTs than any of the other options. The, the length, uh, the network length per kilometer uh, is pretty similar across. The option four, of course, has a much, such a much shorter length. It's, it's, it's performing well in that measure. Um, the redevelopment area, I think this is actually really significant, right? You have 553 hectares of potential development that would be ideally, hopefully, you know, mid-rise developments along these avenues in corridors. What I imagine is the ideal future urban form of Scarborough to create a transit-oriented 
walkable intensification mode is you build corridors of mid-rise all the way along those avenues with a, uh, some sort of rapid transit. It doesn't matter whether it's a bus rapid transit or a light rail transit or maybe a, you know, a, a, some sort of uh, exclusive right of much better right of way so you've got some speed and capacity. But then those residential neighborhoods that are within walking distance of those corridors become much better places to live because instead of you know this very low density retail strip with huge parking lots for all of the kind of low density retail, you probably keep most of that retail on the ground floor, right? You just to say, okay, let's keep have a retail use in the storefront to create a walkable uh, corridor. Anyway, so I'm just um, uh, moving right along here. Uh, on all of the measures, basically, the combination of maybe smart track with the LRT, but it's, it's really the LRT that's performing extremely well in terms of generating lottery development area. The population that's within walking distance is far higher, but the population within walking distance per kilometer is also higher in that combination. Okay, time to wrap up. Uh, and the jobs. Um, so yeah, so the, yeah, I was sort of skipping back and forth. Yeah, I think that idea of having uh, an, an intense corridor is, is actually makes sense. The, the urban form of Scarborough, which we see on this mapping, if you look at this again, having sort of gone through that logic, right? Uh, and if we're, I, th I think I'm absolutely correct in saying these areas, these stable residential neighborhoods are not where there's potential for development, redevelopment and intensification in Scarborough. It's these corridors that are, have this huge amount of width so that you could easily slip in the light rail lines in the center, have three lanes of traffic on either side, have two lanes on each, you know, double lane of bicycle lane, have a 10-foot sidewalk, and then still have some room for tree planting, right? Because, I mean, 120 feet is this gigantic corridor. Now most of that extra space is used for parking. Uh, so it's these corridors that are really the opportunity, not the north-south ones as much, because, again, they have a lot of, you know, single-family residential, tiny little parcels that will not be easy to redevelop. But also, in terms of the health of Scarborough, right, in terms of the long room, long term kind of, I mean, Scarborough the, has had this massive de, um, uh, impoverishment. I mean, it's, it's, be, it's steadily becoming one of the poorest parts of, uh, of, the, of the city of Toronto. Uh, the people who live here are actually the ones that need transit more than anybody else. Uh, and having that investment in, you know, everything in terms of, you know, more housing, a lot of really in, more expen inexpensive sites for housing along those corridors, create the public transit, have uh, that kind of, uh, 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 that corridor of mixed high density use is actually going to benefit everybody in this region and create a, a, a transit opportunity, but also a, an investment that would provide opportunities for better services and all that kind of stuff so that you can live along the transit lines. Anyway, we will see. Uh, uh, keep your eye on the, the newspapers this week. I'm sure this will be dismissed as like, oh yeah, you know, it's like some, some nutcase who likes LRT lines. But hopefully, my only hope for the, the, the report actually is that it provides a little bit of ammunition for those who are saying, this, the subway extension uh, really is not worth the money. And uh, in some ways there is a logic behind that, but if you say, well, that $3 billion could create a, a pretty fast network for the over, that covers the whole of Scarborough and that is mixed to the potential of creating these avenues of mid-rise, that it actually makes this, the subway extension look not so attractive. And if we make that, just that little bit of contribution to the debate, then I'll be happy, sort of, maybe. <laughs>